management. Matt's also a recognized expert in combustible dusts, related regulations, and has been featured in multiple publications as an author and an expert. Please welcome Matt Williamson. Uh, thank you, Courtney. So uh, this presentation was originally intended for the AOCS conference that was going to be held in Montreal this week. Uh, but since that was canceled, we decided to go ahead with it uh, as a webinar. Uh, so the, uh, the topic for this year's presentation uh, we chose was on technical trends, things that we've seen from the perspective of uh, an engineering consultant. Uh, we work with a number of different uh, oil seeds clients uh, across different areas and oil seeds. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm looking at, or what we're looking to do is share with you some of what we've seen. So the key drivers of the uh, oil seeds industry uh, that we have seen uh, first, uh, and primarily, uh, changes have been caused by regulatory change. And regulatory changes have uh, been driven predominantly by safety, uh, as well as food safety and some environmental changes over the past several years. Uh, other changes, of course, we've seen financial changes uh, to co for cost and capacity pressures. The market is growing. Uh, it's growing rapidly. Uh, so there is a lot of pressure for uh, increased capacity in the market. And of course, we want to, and of course, we've seen the integration of new technologies as well. And of course, there are commercial changes uh, that impact the market tremendously uh, as a result of evolving consumer demands. And consumers are demanding new things, different things, uh, and customers, particularly stores, are looking for more variety and uh, to have something that differentiates them on the store shelves from their competitors. All of this puts pressure back on the manufacturers. So starting with the regulatory trends, uh, I start with my favorite topic. Uh, if you've seen my presentations over the past several years, you know I always have been talking on combustible dusts uh, because this has been one of the most significant changes we've seen in the industry over the past several years. Uh, NFPA 652, which was issued back in 2015, has had a tremendous impact on the industry. And in fact, this has been one of the major capital drivers that we've seen in recent years. Um, a lot of facilities were built in the 80s, 90s, and they were built before these regulations came into play. So there are a lot of, uh, lot of pieces of equipment, particularly dust collectors, uh, as well as some bucket elevators, silos, bins, that uh, are way out of compliance. And uh, part of the requirement for that, of course, is you have to have a DHA completed by September of this year. And that has not changed. So uh, when it the last time it did change, it was originally set to to be due September of 2018, and the month before that due date, they extended it another two years to this year. So DHAs are continuing to occur. Uh, they are tending to occur remotely now, where in the past we would uh, we would have done that in the field. But uh, we are able to do those remotely, uh, and that's something that, uh, that needs to be done. Dust explosions have continued to occur. They continue to draw OSHA attention. They continue to get citations and fines. Uh, an example, this was, uh, this, now granted this is a corn mill, but back in 2017, a single dust collector caused this. Uh, in 2017, the Didion facility in Wisconsin uh, had an explosion in a dust collector in the center of a packing area uh, that caused a chain reaction that took down their facility and caused five fatalities. Other things that we've seen uh, in the industry, uh, largely from an environmental standpoint, has been a lot of pressure on wastewater. And wastewater is something that has been driven not so much on a national scale, but on uh, local municipal scales, and certain, then the municipalities have been pushing regulations a little differently 
across the country. Um, here you see where most of the uh, most of the wastewater sources, of course, are from the refinery, but there is a significant contribution from the skim pit in crush and extraction as well, as well as some other sources such as stormwater and uh, blowdowns. So the, the changes that we've tended to see in permits and permit requirements, one of which uh, t has tended to come up a lot is, is FOG or FOG, which is fats, oils, and greases. We're starting to see more and more surcharging on this and tighter pH limits as well. So we're seeing facilities start to do more and more to handle their wastewater. Food safety is another major change that uh, has really caused a lot of, uh, a lot of activity uh, in the oil seeds industry, particularly in those facilities that have bottling and packaging on site where uh, whenever you're dealing with product that is going straight to consumers, uh, you have to follow the, the regulations driven by FISMA, uh, putting together HACCP plans, segregating zones of the facility to keep the dry areas away from the wet areas. Lecithin is one area where we have worked uh, in particular and have seen uh, a number of issues related to food safety. Um, another thing that we have seen as a result of the, the last wave of uh, FISMA changes were to deal with adulteration. That is the intentional uh, potential sabotage of the food stream uh, to reduce the potential for that, the likelihood of that. And we have found that that's causing some increased demand in automation uh, to remove the number of human touches involved in the process. Uh, nitrogen padding, nitrogen line blowouts, these are something we're seeing quite a bit as well. Uh, my, thought, my concern here is, of course, you're bringing nitrogen into some facilities that may have not been designed for that. Uh, so you need to be very careful as nitrogen can create other hazards uh, as it's fixing the food safety issue. All of this is driving a need for better documentation. And documentation uh, we have found for older facilities is quite lacking. So we're having to spend a lot of time with facilities building up uh, as built facility drawings, P and IDs, uh, helping them to understand what they have so that they can react to it, respond to it, build better HACCP plans or combustible dust uh, uh, mitigation plans as well. Uh, a tool that has come available in recent years and is getting better and better, uh, something we do in-house is laser scanning. Laser scanning uh, allows us to go into a facility, spend, spend very little time with very little human contact with the facility, and get a tremendous amount of information in a very short period of time, bring that back to the office or now in our homes, and... Uh, put piece together very, very detailed information about those facilities, putting together as-built facility drawings, uh, including a tremendous amount of detail. Another uh, thing that we've been asked for uh, a bit, quite a bit in recent years uh, is electrical and electrical health assessments, assessing the capacity uh, to do in doing things like short circuit studies, arc flash analysis, that sort of thing has also uh, been needed quite a lot in recent years. Financially, the trends have been toward more and more capacity and, of course, cost savings. Cost savings is not a new trend. That's been a reality in manufacturing forever. Uh, but that has, has been counterbalanced by a need for more and more and more capacity uh, as the industry has grown. However, one thing that has caused conflict with that is a demand for more and more flexibility. And flexibility has been needed more on the consumer end and from the customer end because they're demanding more and more product differentiation and because there's more, more and more need for new and different types of oils to be blended. One thing that we are seeing with a lot of the newer facilities, the ones that are being built today brand new, is that they tend to be smaller facilities than, uh, than the ones uh, already in existence. 
and they are producing a greater variety of products. They're more fully automated with fewer people having to run those facilities. So they're offsetting their scale with less human interaction. The older and larger plants that we work with uh, are doing a lot of work to add additional co-products to bring higher margins because the margins have been fairly tight on the commodity uh, oils. So these new co-products such as lecithin, vitamin E, the proteins, that sort of thing, uh, have driven higher margins. So there's been a lot of retrofitting of existing facilities to bring in these, these new types of products. The industry itself, however, we have found very resistant to change. Uh, the mantra for, for the industry is that we only use proven technology. We don't want to be the guinea pig. We don't want to be the first to use something. We want to see that it's proven before we'll bring it in. And when that happens across an entire industry, it tends to slow down the pace of change and, and makes it very difficult to bring in new technologies. The other thing that has slowed this down is that uh, there are fewer and fewer equipment vendors that are buying up other vendors, not to name names like AGI, who are buying up all of the, uh, the other components that make up this industry, that build equipment for this industry. And that's driving less and less competition. So these equipment vendors want to push their technology. And once they've, once they've aligned the, the industry on their technology, that's, that's where it tends to sit. So other, other newer technologies like uh, the vertical conditioners, uh, which Solex and Crown both have excellent vertical conditioners. They've made some inroads, but for the most part, we find facilities sticking with their rotary steam tube conditioners. It's old technology, it's proven technology. And even when they put in something new, we're still seeing them want to keep with these rotary steam tubes. Hexane extraction, the industry is growing, hexane extraction is not going to go away, but the most of the growth that we're seeing in the industry has actually been a step backward, more toward mechanical extraction. And we'll get into more of that as we talk about commercial changes. So the industry is resistant to change, but change is in fact happening. So new things that are coming in, one of course, the, uh, the disappearance of hydrogenation across multiple facilities. There are very few, very few facilities still doing any kind of hydrogenation. We're seeing more and more palm oil, coconut oil, uh, these tropical oils coming in that require technologies like transesterification. And we're seeing some facilities bring that technology onto site and to handle the, the palm oils, the, the new things that are coming in the industry. One thing that we've certainly seen by COVID-19, and of course I have to mention the coronavirus and what that's done for the industry, is we've seen a greater awareness uh, for storage capacity because there's a concern. What if we have to shut down that plant? What if our end user is not able to bring in as much of the product as we want to produce? We can slow our plant down, but not that much. So to keep our plant running, we need a little more storage on the end product. And we're starting to see some of that demand and COVID-19 is driving some of that. Other things that we're seeing a lot of in a lot of different facilities is a demand for on-site blending of different oils to make those custom products and to provide some of that flexibility that the main process may not provide. Other side, uh, uh, products that we're seeing require new things like extraction of sterols, and vitamin E from fatty acid distillates. So we recently completed a very large project uh, to produce some of these things from fatty acid distillates. And of course, there's the digital transformation. This is happening in the oil seeds industry. We're seeing a push, uh, int more interest in automation across the industry. One push that we're seeing is more for more remote access. And again, this is something that uh, we believe uh, will impact the, uh, the industry as 
more and more demand will be there for remote access control of facilities. Uh, but further automation also improves the time for changeovers, quicker blends, and more consistent, uh, more consistent blends and optimization. So commercial trends, uh, these are the other things that we're seeing and some of, some of the more interesting changes that we're seeing in the market. Uh, as I mentioned, hydrogenation is uh, finding lim more limited use, uh, particularly in non-food application. So uh, that, that change has pretty much already hit the industry, but we are still seeing a tremendous trend toward not only non-GMO, but all the way to organic blends and organic products. And organic oil seeds are quite different from uh, the standard soybeans that you find in the US. You often have to go overseas to find sources for the organic soybeans. They are starting to appear in the US, um, but to make it a product organic, what they're looking to see, uh, as you already see on the shelf, it, with canola oil, these are not, uh, these are things that where they're looking for mechanical extraction. Okay, they, they want to see no hexane, they want, uh, it, and we're starting to see that even in the soybean industry, where there's a demand, a push for uh, mechanical extracted or expeller pressed oils. And that, it, that the growth in that market is significantly outpacing the growth in the overall oil seeds market. So new plants that are being built are being built with mechanical extraction. They don't have near the capacity of the big hexane extraction facilities, but we're seeing them pop up more and more. So this is something that uh, we think we're going to see in the industry for the foreseeable future. Some other things we may see out there in the marketplace, uh, we know that biodiesel is growing. Uh, there's been a lot of projection for tremendous growth in the biodiesel market. I don't know that that's really coming to be a reality as projected, but it is there. Other oils on the market, uh, algal oils have been around for a while. They've been trying very hard to generate new um, new and different uses for the algal oils, but uh, they are tending to stick with, the, with biofuels for algal oils. CBD oil and hemp oil, this is something that we're getting a lot of discussion uh, from different clients, and they tend to be very small players that are trying to build these skid-mounted units, pilot-scale-sized units, in their garages with very, very small uh, amounts of production, but uh, the market is still in its infancy. It's uh, just starting to grow, but there's a lot of thought that, uh, that it's going to grow very quickly. What we expect to happen is the, that these small players, as they start to, as some of them start to become successful, the bigger ones are going to start buying them out. So that's what success looks like for those small players to have a facility big enough to get it bought by a bigger player in the market. Uh, other opportunities that we've seen have been in particular for protein and protein isolates, uh, not only for human food uh, and protein bars, that sort of thing, but also in uh, animal feed. And of course we know what's happening in the uh, ethanol industry is all of a sudden now there's uh, there's very little demand for the ethanol, which means their their main co-product, which are the, uh, uh, the the animal feed products, are having to find supplements from other places. So the DDGs just aren't being produced because the ethanol is not in demand. Uh, other things that we've seen in demand for is aquaculture, fish food uh, for fish farms, there's a tremendous demand for protein for that, and uh, a number of players are bringing in some novel, new, novel uh, grains, other materials like barley, um, uh, or even uh, the black soldier fly larva is something that, uh, that is out there in demand, particularly for the fish food industry. 
Um, so that those products tend to have a much higher margin, uh, and there are a lot of projects on the uh, in the industry to produce more and more of these. So with that, are there uh, if there are any questions?